Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Ludwig here, and welcome back to the last and final session of Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Live. Uh, I'm Christopher Ludwig, and it's my pleasure to have had you here for this journey, this marathon journey, covering the changes, challenges, and opportunities across the automotive supply chain, whether it's recovering and managing from the coronavirus crisis and dealing with the uncertainty ahead on both the supply and demand side, uh, as well as the new technologies in this transforming the sector, and electrification, connectivity, uh, and all the shifts and changes it brings in manufacturing, on the customer side, uh, and also, of course, in the supply chain. Um, we've looking, been looking across global trade shifts and sourcing changes, uh, all across macroeconomic, geopolitical, and technologically shifts, but also on the people side too. And that's been a major focus of this event uh, in terms of the skills, uh, aptitudes, and attitudes that we need uh, for the supply chain leaders of the future. I think that transformation is relevant for many, many companies, but some of the most interesting aspects, in my opinion, are for tier one suppliers who in some cases are having to evaluate and consider their business models. For some, that will mean risks and threats to core products and processes. For others, it's tremendous opportunity to move deeper into the value chain, develop new revenue streams, and indeed new relationship with customers. It's those aspects which make me so excited to bring on our next guest for our closing interview. Yazaki itself is a fascinating company with key products that fall probably on both sides of what I've just mentioned, uh, including opportunities to grow in electronics and batteries, for example. And Bo Anderson, who's president of the company in Europe, North and Central America, is a leader who always provides an honest and fascinating viewpoint and has played such a key role in transformations of other companies. Until 2017, when he joined Yazaki, he was president of Russia's Avtovaz, uh, and before that, Gaz. And of course, he spent more than 20 years at General Motors, including as Group Vice President of Global Purchasing and Supply Chain. And Bo, it's so wonderful to have you here, and thank you for taking time to speak to our audience today. Thank you, Christopher, and, and thank you to the Global Purchasing Supply Chain Logistic people. Many of you I've worked with, many of you I've learned things from, and I will continue to learn things from. So thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, and I know the audience is excited for that. So, Bo, let, let's start with a bit of a status update on where Yazaki is in the wake of COVID. So, how would you characterize, in first place, the company's business performance? Have you seen a strong recovery, a bit more tepid, uh, perhaps in the Americas and, and EMEA? I mean, first, when you look at what I'm responsible for, I'm responsible for roughly 140,000 people in 28 countries. I would say it's not the easiest time to manage a company of this size and complexity. Today, we are roughly back to 85% of revenue and roughly 55% of profit. Okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, at 85% of revenue, that's a perhaps a stronger recovery than many were anticipating. And um, I suppose, uh, as you mentioned, all those people, you know, that's an obviously important signal for all the people in those organizations. Would you say, in terms of the the, the product mix um, for Yazaki, are you are you moving with the market? Are you outperforming it? Um, are the places where you still need to catch up? I would say first, a lot of people don't know a lot about Yazaki. We are a privately held company, but if I take the short facts, so today globally, we have thirty three percent of electro ele electronic distribution systems for gas and diesels. We have fifty percent for hybrids and fifty percent for full electric. So I would say we are moving faster than the market. We also have five startup companies that we are normally not allowed to mention, but you can figure out who they are. So for us, it has been a good growth session. We are also growing in components and uh, own main cables. We have also more customers that are asking us to do what I call battery packs. Mm. Mm. And, and in terms of the, um, the, the coming out of the, well, in terms of COVID, are you feeling, still feeling the effects of the post lockdown of restrictions, social distancing or, or other impacts on, on, on business operations or capacity, for example? What I've asked our team members to do is to really connect from day one with the local health authorities. So we, we have been doing a very good job. If I take where we had challenges was in Portugal in, in April, we are in a city called Ovar that is outside Porto. The government decided to close down the city for a long time. Today in Mexico, 
government is really looking after the people that are in the risk factors. We have 5,000 people that are viewed by us and the government as risk factors. So we pay them, but we let them stay at home. So I would say we have adjusted very quickly to, if the government support us, if the government understands our importance in the local community, they will support us. And we are not taking risks. Mm -hmm. And as I said to Christopher before, we have been much better off than most of our competitors regarding people being sick and having fatalities. Have we had fatalities? Yes, mm -hmm. but at a very small number. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that is such an important metric at this point, which is hard to put into business context. But but this is the, the, the lifeblood of the business, of course, is is the people and 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 their obvious safety. Um, you know, uh, throughout this event, we've been hearing from quite a few people in, in the U.S. in particular who who've, who've pointed to some issues with absenteeism, so labor shortages, uh, perhaps particularly in some states where where the, um, the the government support has maybe outweighed the the benefits of, of working. Has that been an issue for, for Yazaki in parts of your operations or the supply chain? Not really. I mean, in North America, we have a small operation in northern Michigan that are doing terminals and, and we have had no problems. In Mexico, as I said, we have roughly 5,000 people there. We are supporting the governor's in initiatives and our initiatives when we have operation in El Salvador and Nicaragua. So I would say so far we have not had any of these issues. Right. And as you allude to there, you know, just naming some of the, those countries i mean as a in the wiring harness side of the business and electronics you, you know you're talking about quite a, a complex supply chain and, and certain locations which are not always probably so easy to plug into that has that made restarting and ramp up uh, more challenging in some cases i mean yes or no if you look at in north america we we built somewhat for inventory and that means that we have 27 distribution centers in Mexico and in the US. They have always been working. Yes. So the important thing is we have not been impacted. On the other hand, in April and May, with very little revenue, we were sitting with a lot of inventory. Right, right, right. So you have moved the inventory. But that, that I imagine, has, has, moved, has depleted more by now. From June, when we started coming back in North America, we have been shipping roughly 80 percent from inventory if you take in europe we have a very different business model and with most of our german oems we have 80 hours 80 to hours. produce and ship that harness that goes into say like a bmw and seven series so in europe we are working in what we call a sequence uh, centered operations that has benefits but also disadvantages right Right, right. Especially when you have critical inventory that, uh, or in a time disruption, can 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 risk risk shutting down plants, for example. So, yeah, but when we talk about you, you mentioned that the people aspect of that and keep people safe. I wanted to think about what are some of the important lessons as a leader leading these organizations. You mentioned one hundred forty thousand people. Um, you know, going through this crisis, what what has come out for you as a leader? I mean, first, we, we have said to ourselves that we will never compromise health and safety. We are a very social oriented company. Uh, on the other hand, we are in many different countries. So like in Europe, we are in 20 countries. The most important thing is really the role of the plant managers. And I would say many of our plant managers, they have risen to the challenge. And I thank them for what they are doing. We quickly created a global command center, and we have now had more than 100 meetings where we share best practices uh, twice a week, and we cascade best practices, and we also make sure that we have one set of data on how we are performing. Absolutely. So, so this this visibility um, across the supply chain and across these departments um, seems seems to have become really critical. Uh, and then brought out even more by the crisis. Yes. And you know, what, one of the one of the aspects I thought would be interesting to raise here um, throughout this this period, there's been calls for further regionalization, localization of the supply chain to 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 improve resiliency, maybe less reliance on certain countries, dual sourcing. Um, you know, you have someone who's led big, huge supply chain organizations for large parts of, of your career. So you certainly understand the complexities of that. Um, is, is it a viable strategy? Is it, is, it, is it an appropriate objective to 
to increase regionalization now? I would say that we, we always need to look at what is the optimal solution. I, I can tell you that in, in December, January and February, I didn't get a lot of sleep because we had 1900 part numbers that we got out of China. And unfortunately, we had some suppliers that were very close in the Wuhan region. But we never missed the shipment to our end customers. Was it difficult? Yes. If you take April, May and June, we had different type of challenges. And here we found out that we have made sourcing decisions where we buy what simple parts that were not optimal source. So we may buy small plastic parts for Europe from Nicaragua. And it just happened by accident. So now we are looking at everything we buy and say, is this an optimal strategy? Is it fitting with our total cost principle? Are we better off having two sets of tools and one tool set taking care of our Asian customers and another one localized in Europe? So I would say we are trying to localize as much as of our suppliers to the region where we built. Absolutely. So there's an important regional strategy there based on, on the product and, and the market there. We've also seen lots of debates around, around inventory, uh, uh, particularly whether there should perhaps be some more buffer allowed for cases like this in some parts of the crisis. Um, we know cost management is so important there and keeping high inventory, of course, is high, uh, high cost. Um, you, you already mentioned two different business models in a way. And so does that, is that really what drives it mostly for Yazaki in terms of those, you know, those production and the customer models there? I mean, most of you know how it is to work for privately held companies. And, and when I joined Yazaki, I was very surprised that President Yazaki said, Bo, you need to understand that if you have a line stop, you need to report it to me. Uh, I was very surprised because we, we supply millions of parts every month. And I said, you really mean that you want to hear if you have line stop? He said, yes, my principle, we should never stop the line at any OEM. And I would say that the good thing in Europe, we had no line stops the last 12 months. Were we close? Yes. And in North America, we had one that we shouldn't have had. But I think it starts with a culture. We don't want to have a line stop with our customer. And we pride ourselves for that. Now I'm returning that and say, why should our suppliers have line stops with us? Mm. We are not that strong there, but we are getting stronger. Okay, okay. So you, you've caused no line stop at all. One, it sounded like North America, but wouldn't, couldn't quite say the same of your own supply chain about Yazaki. <laughs> not today, but we're working on it. Okay, and, and one of the parts of it that would perhaps be uh, important to working on that would be the visibility in the supply chain. And so in, in terms of Yazaki's supply chain, um, which I imagine is quite complex, do you, do you have a clear enough view uh, across that, perhaps particularly across some of the lower tiers? Absolutely no. And if I give you a flavor is that in North America, to our customers, we, we supply roughly 27,000 port numbers every day. In Europe, we supply roughly 40,000 part numbers. If I take globally, what we buy from our supply base is roughly 100,000 part numbers. And the good thing is that our global purchasing that I've been managing now for the last year, we know that the top 50 suppliers, they stand for 88% of our, our volume, but not the part numbers. So we are working very much on what I call total value chain visibility, but we have a lot of work to do. Mm, mm, mm. I, 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 can, I can imagine, uh, you know, and, and I believe you're also as well as leading these regions in, in EMEA and in, 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 in the Americas there, you have uh, some lead on global purchasing globally, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken about that, at Yazaki. Um, you know, but doing that, have you been able to, looking at that total value chain, find more synergies, for example, in purchasing and perhaps also in areas like logistics? I would say first, I, I, I didn't apply for this job, but I, I got the job somewhat by accident because I used the case of, of line stops. I said to President Yasaki roughly one and a half years ago, I know your philosophy on line stops and we're doing well. And I said, do you know how many line stops our largest supplier had to us last year? He said, no. I said, can you give me a number? He said, I don't know. I said, it was 177 line stops. Wow. And the 77 line stops meant that we need to send our people home. We need to bring them back work overtime. We need to do premium freight. And that's how I got the global purchasing job. Uh, what have I learned? We are an $18 billion organization globally. Uh, direct purchasing is $10 billion. 
10 billion. So it's a big number. Yeah. Yeah. And the best case where we have put together our global purchasing for US logistic people, it may not be a big buy, but every year we buy 14,000 containers uh, of ocean freight, mainly from Asia. For the first time, we put it together in one package. It was 100 million. We went to the ocean freight supply base and offered them this whole package. And we got very good bids. We, we saved money. We took a rather risk-free approach. So instead of saving 20%, we said we are happy to save 10% because we don't want to take more risk. But it highlighted that our plants in Asia had some principles, some preferences. Our plants in Europe had other principles and in North America. So we put together what we call, what is our expectation? And we have a strong leader uh, with the name of Adam that sit in Paris that was managing this whole package during three months. And here I say to many of you that are in logistics, we have many opportunities for you to show that you can do a better job. We are going much more towards having free PL solutions instead of having our own warehouses. We are very focused on, on reducing our inventory, but we are also focusing on localizing. And as I said, we do a lot of freight. Unfortunately, we also do premium freight. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask about that because yes, if you talk about 177 line stops, uh, you probably had to spend a lot of premium freight to avoid making it even more um, uh, at that sort of rate. Again, I mean, we, the important thing is, I still think that we have done a good job, but if you have been in this business long enough, you understand that there are always a necessity. Yesterday, we were chasing one container in, in San Francisco and we found it. And the guy that helped us to found it, we said we easily pay you ten thousand dollars because it's worth more than that. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't think as the president of a company I should chase containers, but no. I love doing small things, and I will continue to do that. Yeah, uh, well, it sounds like it. well, in these times, you know, everybody rolls up their sleeves in in these times. Um, but but uh, I, I'm sure that uh, given given your experience as well, this is this is certainly to the benefit of of the company. And um, and I did want to ask. I mean, you've alluded to some there in terms of bundling global volumes. You know, uh, some examples of if the other best practices in, in purchasing that that you're bringing there too. I mean, you know, not to talk all about the past, but clearly you you, you led um, huge purchasing organizations at General Motors and obviously as president of other companies. So, yeah, there are other examples you would point to. I would say that the most important thing for me is that I I love a purchasing passion because it's a lot of complexity and you can make a huge difference. What we have done as a team. Uh, we have mainly introduced simple metrics on quality service technology and price. Secondly, we have done a categorization of what we buy. So tape is tape, wire is wire, connectors is connectors, terminals is terminals. And then we have the best people we can find in the industry. And with these three things, it takes you a long way. Absolutely. Well, and, and you, you sent out a powerful message, I think, to, especially to this audience and that there's opportunities. You're, you're looking at 3PL models, not to do it all, all yourself in that way. Um, you know, is that is that the key areas you, you need some help in? Would, it, would there be other bottlenecks that you're facing or issues that you'd want to highlight to say this is really an area that Yuzaki will need support and, and, and expertise in, 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 in supply chain and logistics? I think first we see that our customers are relying more on us. We, we are moving more to a full service model than built to print. Built to print doesn't really work for us. Secondly, we will constantly look at our footprint. And third, as I said, a very big piece of our cost is spent on material, logistics, warehousing, distribution. We see that we are becoming more competitive in doing sequencing. And if we can build the components, say like cable terminals ourselves, we can be part of the design of a harness or the ele electronic distribution system. Uh, and if we can build them in our plants and we can sequencing into the customers. So GM has a facility in Lansing. We sequence 5,000 harnesses every day. And we have roughly one hour to get ready. And if we have a line stop, we will feel it immediately. And the young lady that is the manager up there, her name is Pam, 
I visited her a couple of weeks ago and she knows what she's doing. And I said, are you afraid of me? She said, no. I said, what do you mean? Uh, she said, I said that, what, why are you afraid? She said, I was afraid of you 2008. I said, why were you afraid 2008? She said, you were head of global purchasing. I had a line stop and then I was afraid, but that was the la last line stop I had. So the important thing in cradle to grave model works for us, mm. but to do that, we need partners. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned there about the, the preference there for built it's full service. The build to print doesn't doesn't really work for you. I mean, the current, if you looked across your customer base right now, how does that sort of split? Is that is that you still have a fair amount of, of, of build to print or is it shifting away? We are trying to reposition ourselves and, and we want to be a premium Japanese, relatively expensive supplier. Not everyone can afford us. But if they can afford us, they will get excellent service. They will get perfect quality, flawless launches, and excellent program management. Mm, mm, mm. So that's the that's the push today, to to gain more. That they gain more by by working more closely with you. And we, our yeah. five customers today are Toyota. That is the absolute largest. They have very high expectations. We learn a lot from them. The second one is FCA. Third is GM. Fourth is Ford. Fifth is Honda, but then we supply twenty car sets per day to McLaren as well. Right, right, right. So it, it it varies on the on the on the customer side. There, does that does that sort of model? I mean, is that also an important from a from, from a business from a profit margin side for for Yazaki? Um, you know, especially I mean, even before COVID, uh, tier ones were facing margin challenges. Um, you know, with a squeeze on cost, uh, increase in R and D, and 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 the business side. So I mean, what does that picture look like? For Yazaki, appreciate it's a private company, so um, you know that, that that's not as perhaps publicly available as is for others. But um, you know, how do you see that revenue and margin picture for Yazaki in, in as we look ahead now? As I said, as we are private, so we have a benefits of having a much longer term view. But on the other hand, our shareholders have profit expectations on us, and what we have learned is. The better job we do in continuous improvement, avoiding all type of waste, the better profitability we will have. We have also had some relatively frank discussions with our customers and say, the risk is too high and the reward is too little. And there we have more said that this doesn't work for us. We will always be professional. And if we have selected to end relationship with customers, I've always said to our people that we treat it as a launch so we should perform perfectly to, to the last day. And that's what we say, where to play, where not to play. Uh, the good thing, we have more customers coming to us and say, can you do this? And many of you may not know, but Yasaki was the inventor of the junction box. Uh, when I was a kid, the junction box was maybe $5. Today we have junction boxes on full electric vehicles that are $700. Wow, wow, wow. So that's an important product development side there. The 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 you know I'm, I alluded to it. The the industry in general uh, there's 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 headwinds, uh, certainly pressure for cost reduction, and at the same time I think the supply base is is having to invest more in R and D. Um, is that a similar situation for Yazaki? I mean, you just mentioned uh, the value of some of those parts. Uh, how are you managing that challenge, that balance between the cost squeeze and the 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 investment in in R and D, for example? I mean, we are mainly a manufacturing company and our strength is Japanese manufacturing, but for us, engineering is extremely important. And I would say we spend more time, we spend more money on, on engineering, but we also try to be much more selective on where to spend the money. Mm. Mm, absolutely. And and do you see, you know, in this conference, we've been talking a lot about electrification and and the impact that's having or will impact have on, on the supply chain is that an area that that offers um you know uh, risk and reward or particularly re or more risk or reward for yazaki you mentioned having a large share of some uh, aspects for the petrol and diesel but but then obviously also that will shift with the uh, with ev so how does that how does that look for you from uh, yazaki point of view I mean, first, from a personal perspective, I worked on electrical vehicles since 1993 when I worked on the EV1 at General Motors. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I'm, I'm personally not a very big believer that everyone will drive an electrical vehicle. 
Uh, but third, I, I really believe in hybrids, and we see that some of our customers are getting close to 50% of their market fleet in hybrids. So for us, this is a huge opportunity. And if I take some quick numbers uh, for Yasaki, on uh, gasoline and diesel, we have six to $800 in revenue. On a hybrid, we have $1,400 in Yasaki revenue. And on full electric, we have 2200 Okay. So the opportunity is there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Bo, as um, uh, well, actually, I had an audience question here. Let me let me turn to that audience question quickly. And I think we've addressed some of this, but the audience question is, what do you think will be the biggest challenge for the future, for the future supply chain, um, uh, and how will that change compared to today? I think first we will continue to see more consolidation. Uh, we've announced an upcoming. FCA and PSA, uh, they will have huge buying power. I think we will see plant consolidation. But on the other hand, they will expect more from their partners. Mm. What we hear more and more from our customers is they want the suppliers to take more risk. They want the suppliers to invest more money. And I'm okay with that if we can make money in the end. Mm. So I think the buying power will be larger. We will have more large companies that will be global. On the other hand, as I said, we, we have five startup companies that maybe are not startup companies anymore because from a valuation standpoint, they are large, uh, but they are still small. Yeah, yeah. So there's a whole host of change to come there, fantastic. So I, I wanted to kind of spend perhaps the last section of our of our fireside chat here talking about some aspects of, of leadership and, and people management too. Um, firstly, the first question, in your point of view, what does it take to be an employee at Yazaki in 2020? And as we move into the 2020s, you mentioned primarily being a manufacturing company, engineering is important. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the key, what's, what's the secret sauce? What's the real factors you're looking for now? I mean, for us, it, it's really about passion, being passionate about what we do to continue to drive continuous improvements. And what we want to show to our customers we go all the way. Uh, I've been in situations where we talk to the logistic manager of a plant and we say we are one hour away and he is saying, just hold it and, and we will drive it, right? So we don't want to surprise anyone. And I think this customer intimacy is becoming much more important at every level, at every level. It's not like management, but when our operator talks to the logistic manager in the plant, it means a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, as a leader and someone who's, who's been a leader for, for a while in this industry, you know, who, who would you look at and say someone who's inspired you, you know, the most in your career, whether early or later on? I was I first, I spent 21 years at Yana Motors. I was the first non-American senior executive, not because I was the best, but I was better than most people. Uh, I would say Jack Smith that I learned to know in, in Yana Motors Europe. Uh, when I started at Saab, GM had a rule that the CEO should be American, CFO should be American, the product planning head should be American, and the head of purchasing should be American. He was brave enough to give it to me. He said, Bo seemed to be a good guy, give it to him. And what he lived after was deeds, not words. Absolutely. So meaningful sides there. What's the biggest mistake, or the most important mistake? Let me put it that way. What would you say is the most important mistake you ever you ever made, and something that may have you know changed the way that you approach uh, your leadership or, or working in this industry? I think it's important to make mistakes, but where I'm hard on myself, some of the mistakes I could have avoided if I would have listened better. If I really have listened and if I really had said, tell me again. So some of the mistakes I, I did because I was a poor listener. Mm -hmm. So if we were to kind of look today, obviously working today for a private company, Japanese owned company, and you, you've worked, obviously, you mentioned there for General Motors, and that was a sort of American way of doing things. Obviously, then you spent time in Russia and, and now uh, with, the, with the Japanese. What are the things you're learning from Japanese management and leadership that, that perhaps uh, 
hey, are different to what you knew and, and, and you're, you know, it is really changing the way you work and operate at, at Yazaki? First, I, I've known President Yazaki since 1987. And, and when he asked me in 2017 to come and, and join Yazaki, I said, you know, if you hire someone like me, you get some things you like and you get some things you don't like. And I said, go home and talk to your people. And he went home and waited a month. And when he said, we have decided to hire you. What I've learned from President Yasaki is the whole passion about we should be the best supplier to the customer. The second thing I'm learning from the Japanese is really to go to Gemba and to spend time on the shop floor. The third thing is to show respect for the operator. And if you look at these three, it, it takes goes a long way. Mm -hmm. These, you know, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have in common, we are not afraid to work. In Japan, it's not uncommon that you work 14 hours a day. Yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you've cited some concrete examples in, in some processes that you've brought, you know, in purchasing and then operating. Um, you know, but would you say there's other other ways that that you or your team are also influencing, you know, the, the Japanese approach, perhaps even back in Japan or the way that the company, the company, um, you know, is managed globally? I would say what, what I've surprised with Japanese is my brutal honesty. And sometimes I need to apologize, but they, they like to hear it as it is. Uh, what I do every Friday or Saturday morning, I, I write a simple email on what went well during the week and what didn't go well. And they really appreciate that. And third, you know, they, they like that I take this job very seriously and I continue to develop people at every level in, in the organization. And I think that comes somewhat with my military background. Mm. If you cannot develop people in the organization, you will never have greatness. Mm. Mm. Really, really, I mean, fantastic message there, I think, for, for everyone watching in, 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 this, in this audience. Before I go to one of our last questions, I just have another question from the audience that, that goes back to, I think, something you said earlier. Um, Generally speaking, the question goes, is vertical integration still a good approach um, as the losses due to premium freight stay within the group? Well, that's specific to premium freight, but so in that context, but also in the vertical integration, I mean, do you do you see that as a good a good approach or or obviously it would vary a bit, but what, what is your view on that? I think we need to ask it two ways. There are certain things that make sense for you to, to make. You should make them. Other things makes absolute no sense for us to make. It may be a strange example, but we used to be very large in instrument clusters. We have somewhat lost that strength with the obsolescence of stepper motors. Right. In yesterday's cars, the stepper motor was very important and we made our own stepper motors. Today, everyone can more or less make a cluster because it's a digital cluster. So we are asking ourselves, does it make sense for Yasaki long term to make this ourselves? And in many cases, we say no, right. because we don't have a scale. We don't really want to spend the capex. Uh, in some cases, we say yes. For us to make terminals and connectors makes a lot of sense. For us to make electronics makes very little sense. For us to make cable, in some cases, makes sense. In some cases, it makes no sense. Mm. And in all companies I worked in, I've been responsible for make or buy. And I think any good company has an honest, brutal make or buy process. And where you need to be honest to yourself, if you can buy it better, buy it better. If you can make it better, make it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, but let's close by looking a little bit in, in, into the future. It's 2025. We're reprising this conversation. Hopefully, uh, we can do it in person, um, although still streamed, I'm sure, to a global audience and, and, and taking the best from, from the crisis, but, uh, but hopefully past some aspect of the pandemic. What, what's the most important thing that you hope to have achieved uh, at Yazaki by then in 2025? I think the biggest challenge for all of us is how, how can we adapt to the situation? The companies that are adapting the best, the companies that are adapting the fastest, the companies that are generating new business models out of the situation. I don't like to say it, but I don't think we will go back to the private lives we had before. 
I don't think we will go back to the business lives we had before, but I think there is a lot of opportunities to show that you can add value, that you can do it faster, you can do it differently. And that's what we are striving at, all the people at Yasaki day in and day out. How can we make a difference? And how can we make more value to our customers? And how can we use this situation as a big opportunity to become stronger? Using this opportunity to become stronger, I think that's a, that's a, a, a good and powerful note to end on. Um, and I want to thank you, Bo, for, for taking the time again to, to speak to me and, and to our global audience and actually to outline the strategy and also indeed the opportunities that you highlighted. Again, at least for some of our in, in the supply chain and logistics side, it's been fascinating and interesting from my side. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. And I, when I first learned to know you 15 years ago, you were young and up and coming, and you're still young and up and coming. So, on that <laughs> note, thank you. <laughs> I thank you for that. I hope I can hope I can I can stay at least uh, uh, on the young side, and 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 hopefully move into other stages as well and continue to develop. But uh, thank you so much again, Bo. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll we'll stay in touch. And please, all my best to you, and and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. And so to uh, to our, our global audience as well, um, my thanks to you because this has been uh, quite a journey. Um, just these these couple of days, and in fact, if if I stretch it back further, many of you who are watching, I think, came on 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 our journey at Automotive Logistics, uh, even even in March back then when we turned on our, our live stream hour, launched launched our virtual connections. Uh, as many of you will know us, we, we you know we well known on our, our publications and, and for our events around the world. Uh, that was obviously closed off for us, um, but, but, but for us to be able to connect with you in this audience digitally in this format, in this virtual format, you know, has been such a rich experience from our side and, 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 and really something I want to thank you all for continuing to, to be a part of. Most importantly, I hope that you find it valuable and useful. Um, the sorts of conversations that we've just been able to have with, with the likes of Bo and indeed the, the other, uh, many other leaders who, who are uh, present and experts who, who, who graced our virtual screen and stage. Um, and, and, and I hope many of you got to watch. And if you didn't, there will still be time because uh, as we've mentioned, the, the content remains on this platform on demand for the next 30 days. So, so please take it with you, to, um, you know, watch, watch back things, you know, there's, uh, 32 sessions, um, you know, where we're talking 25 hours or so of content and, and there's so much insight and data there. So take advantage of that. The topics that we, we've addressed throughout this event uh, along to transformation, um, dealing with the crisis, yeah, developing people, um, preparing for electrification, coming out of the stone age into the into the new, new future and, uh, that we have. But I think, you know, there's lots of change ahead and lots of change you know, already behind us, but but there was real messages of opportunity within within that. And a lot of that comes from staying connected, communicating, and working with each other. And I think that's exactly what what um, our speakers have been showing and those in the audience uh, continue, continue to do. So please do that, use this platform to do that, use us to do that. We'll facilitate all the connections that we can to keep that going forward. Uh, let, let me thank our, our sponsors um, who who played such a key role in this event. And as I mentioned, it's not over there either because the networking also remains open for the next two weeks on this platform. Uh, so you continue to visit the e-booths, continue to set up meetings and connect with people for the next two weeks. So don't miss that. Um, and, I, and I point again to our, our sponsors, including our marquee sponsor, Jeffco, our session sponsors, Sigfox, Carter Logistics, Inform, CFR Rinkins, DSV, and Glovis, and DP World, and our panel sponsors, Cosmotech, CNW Career Network, E2Open, Jack Cooper, IPL Macro, Kuno Nagel, CHEP, Siva Logistics, Maersk, Gallega Global, Logisti Glo Global Logistics, and our exhibitors, ProTrans, Fract, Proact, and Evolution Time Critical. Please don't uh, miss the opportunity to connect. It's not over yet. And thank you again for all of our sponsors for sharing your, your expertise uh, with us um, across this event. I want to thank our team here. Um, 
Nemish and Nemish Ladra and, and 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 Richard Logan, who many of you have seen uh, across the screen, they are really, uh, you know, in, in former times we would have said the engine. Now I want to say they're the battery, uh, powering so much of of what you've seen here. Uh, thank you to both of them. They're, they're fantastic colleagues, and I think as you saw, uh, you know, fantastic uh, resources for all of us and all of you to use as well. Um, they are, of course, we are, of course, far from the only. Um, parts of this. There's a, a supply chain to this event which stretches stretches quite a long ways. Uh, and, I, and I would, it would love to spend time to mention everyone, but, but really we're talking our fantastic colleagues in the marketing team and our events team, on our commercial team and our editorial team and our leadership as well. So, so please um, th thank you from my side for making all that possible and, uh, and 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 again do connect with us we also have an e-booth um, so if you want to know more about us or connect with us find us on this platform here um, we'll be back um, firstly and foremost uh, please continue to check out our content online um, articles about this this um, this conference are going up as we speak uh, there's the content uh, the video content and more to come. We'll be reprising our live stream series, live stream hour uh, season two. We'll start again this autumn. We'll have uh, this autumn and, and winter, and we'll have more information on that for you. We'll be having more digital events, which we'll share with you soon. And we will be back in person too, I assure you of that, um, as and when we can. Um, but, but I don't really want to just talk about the time when we can't predict because I think we can connect so well right now. And, and there's so much of what this conference does in connecting that we'll continue to do even when we can physically meet again. But we will meet again. So with that, I, I, I want to uh, sign off. Uh, thank everyone again for your time. Um, wish you, your, your colleagues and families, uh, the best in health in this, in this time. Continue to stay safe uh, and stay connected. And, and thanks very much. We'll see you real soon. Chris Ludwig, signing off here from London. Thank you, goodbye, and good night.